The subject of today's session is the double holiday of Passover, two holidays for two liberations. Once again, we embark upon our quest to explore the messages that emerge from biblical holy days. Of course, here, before we continue, we need to clarify what do we mean by a double holiday? And so, without any further ado, we turn to Exodus chapter 12, where this doubling is explicitly introduced. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, the holiday of Passover is introduced. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. And as part of this seven day holy day, we read in verse 16, both. And in the first day, there shall be to you a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, a holy convocation. So that while the holiday lasts for seven days, there are two major holidays in it on the first day and on the seventh day. As a quick overview, we consider the other passages in the Torah and the five books of Moses that likewise affirm that there is, in addition to the first day, a major holiday on the seventh day as well. The next place is the next chapter. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 6, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to God. Now, we noted in the past that besides the book of Exodus, we read passage that pertains to the cycle of holy days in each of the remaining volumes of the five books of Moses, in Leviticus, in Numbers, and in Deuteronomy. And in each one, first, Leviticus chapter 23, we read in verse 7, in the first day, referring to the first month and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you shall have a holy convocation. And in verse 8, in the seventh day is a holy convocation. So, once again, two major holy days. In Numbers chapter 28, again, pertaining to the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in verse 18, in the first day shall be a holy convocation, you shall do no manner of servile work, and in verse 25, on the seventh day, you shall have a holy convocation. So, once again, two major holidays. And finally, lastly, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, when we read once again of the celebration of Passover, once again, in verse 8, we read, six days shall you eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh shall be a solemn assembly to God your Lord. In other words, once again, the seventh day is designated as a holy convocation besides the major holy day that takes place on the first day. Now, we should note that this is completely unique. We don't find any other holy day in the cycle that we read in the five books of Moses in the Torah that comprises two major holy days as part of the one festival. Consider, in brief, the other holy days. Well, returning to Leviticus chapter 23, we read in verse 21 regarding Pentecost, the festival of weeks, you shall make proclamation on the selfsame day. There shall be a holy convocation unto you. It's just one day. Similarly, in Numbers chapter 28, now in verse 26, also in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meal offering unto God in your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. And note, it is again the day, not days, of the first fruits, one day. And likewise, as for the festivals that take place in the seventh month, beginning with the first day of the seventh month, the holy day that we call nowadays Rosh Hashanah, we read in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall be a solemn rest unto you, a holy convocation, only one day. 
Similarly, when we read about the same festival in Numbers chapter 29, in verse 1, and in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. It is a day of the blast of the horn unto you. And again, one day. Likewise, on the tenth day of the same month, we have Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. And once again, it's one day. So we see it described in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. It is just the tenth day of the month. So too, again, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27, on the tenth day of this seventh month. And in Numbers chapter 29, verse 7, once again, on the tenth day of this seventh month, one day. Now, there is one festival that seems at first brush to violate this rule, and it's important for us to appreciate where the difference lies between it and Passover. I'm referring to Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, about which we read at length in Leviticus chapter 23, in verse 34, on the 15th day of this seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto God. Note, it's seven days. We do read in verse 35, on the first day shall be a holy convocation. And in verse 36, on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. But once again, consider that in verse 34, we already read that the feast itself is only seven days. So clearly, what takes place on the eighth day is a different holy day. Now, intimated in verse 36 is that the offerings brought in the Holy Temple on this eighth day are fundamentally different from those brought on the other seven, which indicates again that we're dealing with a completely different holy day, but perhaps the clearest indication of that is when we consider the central theme of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. It is, after all, our dwelling in the booths. And regarding that, we read in verse 42, you shall dwell in booths seven days. So on the eighth day, you're not dwelling in booths. It's not part of tabernacles. And so, Likewise, when we read in verse 39, you shall keep the feast of God seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. That eighth day is a different holiday. In Passover, both the first day and the seventh day are explicitly part of the celebration of Passover, part of the same festival. And that is without parallel anywhere in the cycle of biblical holy days, which of course inevitably forces us to ask, why? Because as we've noted on many occasions in the past, but I always feel compelled to stress this point, our concern here is not simply to understand what the imperatives are, what the obligation in celebrating this festival is as regards Israel who is commanded to keep the festivals of God. While as such, this, like the rest of the festivals in the Bible, is a Jewish holiday. As you know, I prefer to describe it as a biblical holy day because while it obligates Israel, it clearly has a message to everyone who believes in the words of the Bible. If we seek guidance in our lives in the Bible, we need to understand why there are these two holidays and what message or messages emerge from them in our understanding just what God is telling us through obligating Israel in keeping these festivals. And so, inevitably, we return to where we began, Exodus chapter 12, where at least 
we get clear explanation of what the message of the holiday on the first day is. What are we commemorating? Well, as we read in Exodus chapter 12, after in verse 16, once again affirming these two holidays, that in the first day there shall be to you a holy convocation, and in the seventh day a holy convocation, we read in verse 17, and here we're clearly referring to the first day. In this self-same day have I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. And of course, it should be superfluous to note, this is historically inescapable. The first day of Passover is the day of the Exodus. So of course, we're commemorating our Exodus from the land of Egypt on the first day of Passover. Well, that's easy enough to understand, but what about the seventh day? What does that commemorate? And glaringly, in Exodus chapter 12, we get no clarification at all. Where do we see clarification? Oh, save us the quest by pointing out that there is nowhere in the Bible where we ever are told what the seventh day commemorates. But of course, in the traditions of Israel, we base ourselves not only on the written word, but also on the oral tradition. And in considering what the oral traditions that go hand in hand with the written text tell us, we focus upon what we read in Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people were fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned toward the people, and they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? And so we read of the preparations for battle. In verse 6, he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. Verse 7, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over all of them and Pharaoh and Egypt hotly pursue Israel, culminating in verse 9, Egypt pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, encamping by the sea, beside Piachirot, in front of Baal Tzifon. In considering when this happened, because of course, the text doesn't explicitly answer that question at all. We necessarily focus upon a very odd turn of phrase in verse five. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people were fled, were fled, but didn't Pharaoh send them away? And inevitably, our answer must be, well, not exactly. Because when we consider what we read way back at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, on the one hand, God gives Moses the mission, if you will, the game plan. In verse 16, after God assures Moses, I have surely remembered you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. In verse 17, I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So the mission, the plan, is Israel is, as it were, remembered by God, to be redeemed from the affliction of Egypt and brought, well, we know which is the land flowing with milk and honey. We should note that it is in verse 17 that we encounter the expression, a land flowing with milk and honey for the first time, 
but it's clearly referring to the land of Israel, the land of the Canaanite. And yet, the very next verse, God tells Moses that the way he is to approach Pharaoh is by soliciting, and now let us go, we pray you, three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to God our Lord. Just three days. And indeed, that's what happens. In Exodus chapter 5, in verse 3, when Moses and Aaron come before Pharaoh, they say, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray, three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice unto God our Lord. Similarly, in Exodus chapter 8, in verse 23, once again, the same demand is repeated. We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to God our Lord. So all along, Moses only is thinking about three days, precisely as God commanded him. So inevitably, we consider that what is communicated by Pharaoh in allowing Israel to go is just that. In Exodus chapter 12, after the plague of the firstborn, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night in verse 31 and said, rise up, get you forth from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve God as you have said, as you have said, three days. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said, three days, and go, go, but then after three days, come back. So inevitably, when we consider that this is, after all, implicit in what Moses had communicated to Pharaoh and what Pharaoh had communicated to Moses, when we go back to chapter 14, verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people were fled. Well, Pharaoh never agreed to the slaves not coming back. So in our tradition, here we supplement what the text tells us with the oral tradition. When Pharaoh sent Israel, he sent them with spies, informers, who are going to check, are the slaves coming back after three days? And when three days passed and the slaves didn't return to their masters, to their bondage, the informers, the spies, went to Pharaoh and let him know the people were fled. They're not coming back. Whereupon, Pharaoh gets together his entire cavalry, as we already noted, and hotly pursues Israel all the way to the sea. Well, considering that it was after three days and Pharaoh has to get his cavalry together and they have to pursue the people of Israel when they actually reach them. In our tradition, it was the eve of the seventh day from the Exodus. The seventh day of Passover commemorates what happened next. That night, God commanded Moses, and the sea split. And Israel crossed the sea on dry land. And Egypt, still in hot pursuit, came into the sea after them, and Egypt was drowned. The morning of the seventh day of Passover, Israel saw Egypt dead by the banks of the sea and sang Exodus chapter 15, the song of the sea, the song of praise and thanksgiving. And to this day, in synagogues throughout the world on the seventh day of Passover, the special reading of the Torah in honor of the holiday begins at the end of Exodus chapter 13, includes Exodus chapter 14 and 15, indeed, this story. The pursuit of the Egyptians, the splitting of the sea, 
the drowning of Egypt and the song of thanksgiving. So, for now, we have a short answer to the question. And if we ask, what does the seventh day commemorate? It commemorates this. It commemorates the miracle that took place at the sea. But of course, inevitably, that raises two other crucial questions that we need to address. The first question is pretty basic and technical, and that is, why do we need a second holiday for that? After all, if we're going to make a special holiday to commemorate every miracle that took place as part of the Exodus, we'll be having holidays all year round. We won't even finish. So, of course, that is not what God ordains. Rather, we have the celebration of Passover, and we appreciate that in celebrating Passover, that is, the first day, we're commemorating all of the miracles attendant to the Exodus. Well, why can't we include this one? Why does this particular miracle demand the second holiday? Why can't we just include it in the commemoration of all the miracles of the Exodus on the first day? Why have a separate day? We still haven't answered that question. What's the message? What are we supposed to learn from this? That's question number one. There is an additional question that we also need to ask. And this admittedly is a much more vexing and troubling point. This is what we commemorate on the seventh day of Passover? The drowning of Egypt? The destruction of all that humanity? It seems like an awfully inappropriate response to what is, after all, a horrific human tragedy. Even if they were our enemies, they're still human beings created with a God likeness imprinted upon them. We have these two questions. Of course, inevitably, we're going to have to try to treat them serially, beginning with question one. But we need to address question two shortly. In first addressing question one, why a separate commemoration here? After all, we commemorate all the miracles of the Exodus on the first day of Passover. We need to consider why altogether there need to be two commemorations. And I think a helpful key we can find in two verses that at first brush have nothing to do with the subject. In Exodus chapter six, I'm reading verses 26 and 27. In your Bibles, they may be verses 25 and 26, but they're the same verses. It's just a question of where the chapter begins. The first of these verses, these are that Aaron and Moses to whom God said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. Second verse, these are they that spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the people of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. Now, when we consider these two verses, it's important for us to remember, this is the word of God. And I should stress that on the most basic plane, that verity is the most crucial foundation in the way we read the Bible. We've noted in the past, I must admit, this is something that for me personally was a learning experience. That when we first began to have these Bible study sessions, and I naturally paid attention to all of the tiny details of the text, I realized that people weren't accustomed to doing that. And at some point it dawned on me that if you read the Bible in translation, you can't really pay attention to detail because you don't know if the detail is really there or it's just a reflection of the translator. That is, if you're looking at the world through a glass window and you see a spot, you don't know if the spot is on the other side or it's just on the window. Inevitably, when people are accustomed to reading the Bible in translation, they aren't accustomed to paying attention to detail. We are. 
we read the Bible in the original, we pay attention to everything. And it's important for me to stress this point. If all we note in the text is the general idea, that is more or less what the gist of the text is, if you think about it, that guarantees we're never really going to be learning anything. Because all we will notice is what we already expect. Rather than the Bible teaching us, we, in effect, are teaching the Bible what to tell us. Obviously, we want the Bible to teach us. And if we really want to learn from the Bible, the greatest treasure is when we encounter something odd, troubling, problematic, even just repetitive, that forces us to ask, why is it here? This is the word of God. If we already expressed the basic idea in the first of these verses, these are that Aaron and Moses, to whom God said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. Why do you need another verse that basically says exactly the same thing? These are they that spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the people of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. Why the repetition? Until we note, these two verses are not exactly redundant. There are a number of differences, of course, but I want to focus upon two in particular that I think are especially critical and definitely relevant with respect to our discussion of the first holiday and the second holiday in the celebration of Passover. First point to note, of course, is as I indicated in my color code, in the first verse, it's Aaron and Moses. They are partners, but Aaron's name appears first. In the second verse, these are that Moses and Aaron. Again, partners, but here Moses appears first. Most critically though, when we consider just what event, what mission is described in these two verses, they are at the root of it, two completely different exoduses. At least, again, if we pay attention to the language. In verse 26, it is, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. In the second verse, it is to bring out the people of Israel from Egypt. Now, you, of course, might rightly point out that you can't leave Egypt until you leave the land of Egypt. That unquestionably is true. Still and all, we should appreciate you might be leaving the land of Egypt and still not leaving Egypt. Leaving the land of Egypt is leaving, after all, a geographical location. That doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're leaving Egypt. A mentality, a state of mind, something spiritual, something that can still be weighing upon you, bearing down upon you, even if you left the land of Egypt behind. There are these two exoduses, leaving the land of Egypt and leaving Egypt. Now, when we consider the order of the two brothers, again, in the first verse, it's Aaron and Moses. And in the second verse, it's Moses and Aaron. I think we can readily understand the switch based upon this reality. Because if we ask ourselves, obviously Moses and Aaron are partners, but which of these two brothers played the primary role in leaving the land of Egypt? In leaving the land of Egypt? Aaron. Just consider, in Exodus chapter 7, God speaks unto Moses and unto Aaron, and the message, which is on the one hand conveyed to Moses, but directed to Aaron is, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, show a wonder for you, 
then you shall say unto Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it become a serpent. A serpent. That's Aaron who is to cast down the staff. And indeed, so it happens in chapter 7, verse 10. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. And ultimately, of course, in verse 12, after Pharaoh's wise men and sorcerers and magicians cast down their staffs that became serpents, it was Aaron's staff that swallowed up their staffs. It doesn't just end with the staff becoming serpent. Consider the first plagues of the 10 plagues of Egypt. In the continuation of chapter 7, we read in verse 19, God said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their, their canals, over their pools, and over all their ponds of water, that they may become blood. And indeed, so it happens. He lifted up his staff and smote the waters that were in the river, and everything turns to blood. That's Aaron's doing. We consider plague number two at the beginning of Exodus chapter eight. God said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And once again, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up. Aaron is the agency of plague number two. Similarly, consider plague number three. In verse 12, God said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out your staff and smite the dust of the earth, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And once again, in verse 13, Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and smote the dust of the earth, and there were lice upon man and upon beast and so on. So, when we consider which of the brothers plays the central role in leaving the land of Egypt, a process that, after all, is initiated through the plagues here. It's Aaron and Moses, the first Aaron. Not so when we consider leaving Egypt. Because again, leaving Egypt, leaving a state of mind, leaving a mentality. How do you go about doing that? Well, to answer this question, we first go all the way back to Genesis chapter 15. God's covenant with Abraham that includes his telling Abraham in chapter 15, verse 13, know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. What's the great substance? Is it simply the gold and the silver? Something of far, far greater substance. Just consider what takes place once again at the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 11, Moses asks God, two questions, or if you will, two challenges. Number one, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? Number two, and that I should bring forth the people of Israel out of Egypt? And he gets two answers. In verse 12, first, God says to Moses, because I will be with you. So if you ask, who am I to go on to Pharaoh, I will be with you. And if you ask, how am I going to bring them forth out of Egypt? How do you get them out of Egypt? It's one thing to get them out of the land of Egypt, but how do you get them out of Egypt? God says, when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you will serve God upon this mountain. This mountain, which mountain? Well, of course we need to recall, that in chapter 3, verse 1, we read the burning bush was at Horeb, the mountain of God. Of course, also known as Mount Sinai. That is, 
what God is telling Moses is when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, not just out of the land of Egypt, you will receive the Torah, the Theophany, God's revelation at Sinai. That's how you leave Egypt. And when we consider the implications, this Torah that God is giving Israel, again, these two brothers, Moses and Aaron, are partners. But the one who has the primary role with the Torah, unequivocally, that's Moses. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 4, Moses commanded us a Torah, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Likewise, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, this is the Torah that Moses set before the people of Israel. And indeed, further elaboration in the next verse, these are the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances which Moses spoke unto the people of Israel when they went forth out of Egypt, not just out of the land. And indeed, historically, this Torah continues to be called the Torah of Moses from the first prophet after Moses until, in the Hebrew Bible, the last. The first prophet, Joshua, in Joshua chapter 23, verse 6, Therefore, be you very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the Torah of Moses. And the third from last verse of the prophets, Malachi, chapter 3, verse 22, remember you, the Torah of Moses, my servant. So, again, recalling these two enigmatic verses, that seemed so repetitive in Exodus chapter 6. We appreciate that in the first of these verses, when we speak of bringing the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, we speak of Aaron and Moses. When we speak of bringing the people out of Egypt, oh, then we speak of Moses and Aaron. And these two exoduses continue to operate in tandem over the course of the whole narrative of the Exodus. Consider first Exodus chapter 12, where repeatedly we read about leaving the land of Egypt. Beginning in verse 17, in this self same day, have I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt? What day do they leave the land of Egypt? That's the first day. And further amplifying the theme of leaving the land of Egypt. In verse 40, the time that the people of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Verse 41 came to pass at the end of 430 years. Even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of God went out from the land of Egypt. Verse 42, it was a night of watching unto God for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And finally, the last verse of the chapter, verse 51, it came to pass the self same day that God did bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. All that leaving the land of Egypt. Until finally, in Exodus chapter 13, we read that when God led the people about, by the way of the wilderness, by the Red Sea. There is a special emphasis, Exodus chapter 13, verse 18, that the people of Israel went up armed out of the land of Egypt. They aren't necessarily out of Egypt yet. The contrast between leaving the land of Egypt and leaving Egypt is starkly and explicitly enunciated in Deuteronomy chapter 16, where we read about this holiday again, of course, in retrospect. And on the one hand, in verse 3, we do indeed read twice, you shall eat no leavened bread with it seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread therewith, referring to the Passover offering, even the bread of affliction, for in haste did you go forth out of the land of Egypt. 
that you may remember the day when you went forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. Because, of course, that's what's happening. But that's not all. In verse 1, in the month of spring, God your Lord brought you forth out of Egypt. Because that, after all, is the ultimate goal. You leave the land of Egypt, but not only. And in particular, it is instructed to consider what takes place in most of Exodus chapter 13. In particular, immediately in the wake of chapter 12, that spoke repeatedly about leaving the land of Egypt, chapter 13 has a different focus. It has a different focus, I would stress, for two reasons. Number one, what are you going to be teaching the children? Leaving the land of Egypt, that was only means to leaving Egypt. So when you educate the children, it's not just going to be about leaving the land of Egypt. Number two, when we speak of the commandments that God charges Israel to keep as a remembrance of the Exodus, performance of the commandments is an expression of our love and devotion toward God. If all you've done is leave the land of Egypt, but not Egypt, you're not ready for the commandments. And so, in Exodus chapter 13, we read, Moses said unto the people, verse 3, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, not land. And in verse 8, you tell your son in that day, it is because of that which God did for me when I went forth out of Egypt, because you're speaking to the children. And in verse 9, it shall be for a sign upon you, upon your hand, and for a memorial between your eyes, that the Torah of God may be in your mouth, for the strong hand has God brought you out of Egypt. Because we're talking about the commandments, the phylacteries, the tefillin, worn on arm and on head, and the message altogether of the Torah, the teaching of God being in your mouth. And similarly, once again, in verse 14, what you say to your child is, by strength of hand, God brought us out of Egypt, not just the land of Egypt. And likewise, in reiterating the commandments, in verse 16, it shall be for a sign upon your hand and for frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of hand, God brought us forth out of Egypt. But how do you get out of Egypt? Getting out of the land of Egypt is fairly straightforward. You just have to get up and move. It's a geographical location. You leave the land of Egypt. It's much more challenging to leave Egypt. And that becomes strikingly clear in Exodus chapter 14. But before we consider what's taking place in Exodus chapter 14, it's important for us to bear in mind translations are always a barrier. In the translation, we will repeatedly encounter reference to the Egyptians. In Exodus chapter 14, how many times do we in fact read about Egyptians? The answer may surprise you. The answer is zero. In Hebrew, the word for Egyptians is Mitzrim. The word for Egypt is Mitzrayim. We never encounter the word Mitzrim, Egyptians, in Exodus chapter 14. We read about Mitzrayim, Egypt. And that's crucial. Because in chapter 14, verse 9, it isn't Egyptians. It's Egypt that pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And in verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, Egypt was journeying after them. That is, they've left the land of Egypt. 
But Egypt is still there. They haven't left Egypt. Egypt is in hot pursuit. Egypt is journeying after them. And they scream. They were so afraid and the people of Israel cried out unto God. And they complained to Moses in verse 11, because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? In verse 12, is not this the word that we spoke unto you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve Egypt? For it were better for us to serve Egypt than that we should die in the wilderness. They haven't left Egypt. They've only left the land. And perhaps the starkest, most obvious indication that they have indeed not yet left Egypt emerges from some very simple, straightforward arithmetic. Because just consider what the forces are arrayed against one another. We read in chapter 14, verse 5, that after Pharaoh hears that the people are fled, they regret having let Israel go from serving us, and Pharaoh gets ready his chariots, and in verse 7, he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over all of them. Well, we don't really know how many chariots there were in all, because we don't know the ratio of chosen chariots to the rest of the chariots. One to two, one to five. Let's even guess one to ten. That is, if there were 600 chosen chariots, maybe there were 6,000 chariots in all. Okay, but how many fighting men are there in Israel? In Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, we read, when the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth upon the Exodus, about 600,000 men on foot were there beside children. Not only that, in verse 38, a mixed multitude went up also with them. Truth is that 600,000 is actually a bit of a conservative estimate because in Exodus chapter 38, verse 26, we read a more exact figure of 603,550 men. And of course, that's only the men. The women can be pretty fearsome warriors as well. So just considering the fighting men, you don't think 100 men can overpower one chariot? And this, of course, is without considering the women and the mixed multitude. So why were they so terrified? They didn't think they would be able to vanquish Pharaoh's cavalry? And of course, the answer is not when you still have a slave mentality. Not when all you've left is the land of Egypt, but not Egypt. From the perspective of the slave, it doesn't matter how few Egyptians there are. Our masters have come. They're calling us back home. The party's over. And indeed, this is precisely the conduct that one would expect of people who have left the land of Egypt, but not yet left Egypt. And it is in this vein that we consider the words of reassurance of Moses, because they're critical. In chapter 14, verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear you not! Stand still and see the salvation of God, which he will work for you today. For as you have seen Egypt today, you will see them again no more forever. God will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. This is the end of Egypt. And indeed, that's precisely what we read in the continuation of Exodus chapter 14. That after the miraculous splitting of the sea, in verse 22, the people of Israel came into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, 
and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And in the continuation, verse 23, Egypt pursued, remember, Egypt is still with them, and came in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch that God looked forth upon the host of Egypt through the pillar of fire and cloud and discomfited the host of Egypt. And he took up their chariot wheels and made them to drive heavily so that Egypt said, I'll stress, this verse is entirely cast in the singular because Egypt, not Egyptians, Egypt said, let me flee from the face of Israel for God fights for them against Egypt. And of course, what then ensues? In verse 26, God charges Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon Egypt, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared and Egypt fled against it. And God overthrew Egypt in the midst of the sea. Verse 30, and this, of course, is the crucial culmination. Thus, God saved Israel that day out of the hand of Egypt, and Israel saw Egypt dead upon the seashore. Everything that Egypt signified, everything that Egypt represented, was there dead, finished, bankrupt, done. And verse 31 Israel saw the great hand which God used upon Egypt and the people feared God and they believed in God because you can only truly revere God and believe in God after you have left not only the land of Egypt after you've left Egypt so it's time we summarize our answer to question number one why do we have a second holiday to commemorate this miracle? It's not commemorating merely a miracle. There are two exoduses. There is the exodus from the land of Egypt, and that's the subject of the first day. And there's exodus from Egypt, and that's the subject of the commemoration of the seventh day. The exodus from Egypt is the crucial prerequisite of being able to receive the Torah at Sinai. That, again, only happens when the people have left Egypt. And consider the implications for us. Because after all, don't we also, all of us, on one level or another, live in a corrosive world? Often, with warped and perverse values. And on some plane, we do indeed need to extricate ourselves from that world. We need to leave our land of Egypt. But that's not enough. We need to flush Egypt out of us. Because otherwise, we are liable to extricate ourselves from society, but everything that is festering in society continues to fester within us. We need not only to leave the land of Egypt, but to leave Egypt. And this remains an ongoing challenge for all generations, which is why, undoubtedly, the first and seventh day commemorations are likewise for all generations. Leave the land of Egypt, but that's not enough. Leave Egypt. Get to the point where you can indeed see that everything that Egypt represents lies before you, dead, finished, bankrupt, done, and over. And only then can you truly revere God and believe in him. Now with that, we embark upon question number two, which I remind you, is really far more troubling, far more vexing. Are we indeed then celebrating the death and destruction of Egypt? And of course, in some sense, we recognize that's not the point. 
the point is leaving Egypt. But at the same time, we do need to consider how we relate to the destruction of our enemies. In particular, we'll note in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17, we read, Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Which would lead us to conclude that the last thing we should do is be happy when we see our enemies destroyed. Except we inevitably appreciate things are more complex. Because in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10, we get a very different message. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked are lost, there is joy. Well, when the wicked are lost, there is joy. So, how do we reconcile that with rejoice not when your enemy falls? We might be tempted to respond, well, just consider that in chapter 24, verse 17, we aren't speaking about the wicked, we're speaking about your enemy. So you certainly shouldn't be rejoicing over the fall of your enemy, whereas in chapter 11, verse 10, it is the wicked who are lost. And when the wicked are lost, there is joy. Now, that may be true, but I suspect that by itself, it is a bit too simplistic and inadequate. First of all, consider that in chapter 24, in verse 16, the verse immediately preceding verse 17, we read that the wicked stumble in evil. When we read the very next line, rejoice not when your enemy falls, let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, it's very difficult to read these words as referring to anyone other than the one to whom we referred in the previous verse, the wicked. I think there may be a more subtle message here. Indeed, your enemy may be wicked. The question you need to ask yourself is, why do you feel inclined to rejoice? If you are relating to the wicked in terms of their wickedness, without any intrusion of ego, my own personal interest, then indeed, as we read in chapter 11, verse 10, when the wicked are lost, there is joy. But if you're relating to him, and then indeed, rejoice not when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Because then it simply is an expression of ego. Then it is your expressing your own personal vested interest, which would have absolutely no place in earnest rejoicing over the downfall of the wicked. As for that downfall of the wicked, if we ask, is it appropriate for us to be happy when the wicked falls, when the wicked are lost? Ultimately, we need to ask ourselves, what is in a real abiding sense for the best. Maybe a good way of expressing this is considering in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 28, where we read, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves. But when they are lost, when the wicked are lost, the righteous increase. What happens when the righteous increase? Proverbs chapter 25, 29, verse 2, when the righteous are increased, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear rule, the people sigh. In verse 16, when the wicked are increased, transgression increases. So the righteous shall gaze upon their fall. We have a saying in our tradition. The success of the righteous is good for them and good for the world. Their success is not just good for them. It's good for the world because the entire world will be beneficiaries of the success of the righteous. When the wicked prosper, when the wicked are successful, it's bad for them and bad for the world. Of course, we understand that it's bad for the world, 
because their success means their success in their act of wickedness. It's also bad for them. If the wicked could only appreciate what terrible damage they inflict upon their own souls through their act of wickedness, well, if they wouldn't be able or capable of repenting, they would undoubtedly sincerely prefer their own destruction. Because every moment they continue on the path of wickedness is just another moment's destruction, another moment's inflicting irreparable damage upon their own souls. So indeed, in much the same vein, the destruction of the righteous is bad for them and bad for the world. The destruction of the wicked is good for them and good for the world. Not just good for the world, good for the wicked. It saves them from committing additional acts of wickedness, from inflicting further damage upon their own souls. And so indeed, we read likewise in Isaiah chapter 14, in verse 5, God has broken the staff of the wicked, the rod of the rulers. And the consequence of that, in verse 7, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. The whole world is all the better for it. Now, we still harp on that question. Are we rejoicing over the destruction of the wicked themselves? And I feel compelled to share with you a story. A story that appears in our tradition that pertains to the closing verse of Psalm 104, verse 35. Story is one of the great sages, Rabbi Meir, had really mean, vicious, wicked neighbors. And he wanted to pray that they should die. And his wise wife, Ruria, said to him, why do you want to pray they should die? Is it perchance because of the way you're reading Psalm 104, verse 35? Now, we need to consider what Psalm 104, verse 35 tells us. In the Hebrew, it speaks of yitamo chataim min ha'aretz, which can indeed be rendered, let sinners cease out of the earth, but the Hebrew chataim can also be translated as sins. That is, let sins cease out of the earth. If the verse would have used the Hebrew chotim instead of chataim, it would be entirely unambiguous in referring to sinners. But the very choice of chataim, explained Ruria to Rebbe Meir, her husband, implies that we aren't seeking the destruction of sinners, but rather the eradication of sin. Let sins cease out of the earth. And of course, inevitably then, let the wicked be no more. Not because they cease to exist, but because they're no longer wicked. Bless God, oh my soul, hallelujah. So don't pray that they should die. Pray that they should repent. Pray that they should return to God. And the story goes that Rabbi Meir listened to his wise wife, Bruria, and prayed for the repentance of his wicked neighbors. And sure enough, they repented and returned to God and left the path of wickedness. So the wicked were no more because they weren't wicked anymore. We're not craving the destruction of the wicked. But we do recognize that wickedness needs to be eradicated. And perhaps the clearest way of expressing that is considering the message of the seraphim. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, they called one unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, the earth is full of its, his glory. But when the wicked prosper, when the wicked have not abandoned the path of wickedness, 
the glory is concealed. We don't see it. And since it is the wicked who prevent us from being able to see the glory of God revealed, we understand that it is precisely through the destruction of wickedness, well, ideally because of the repentance of the wicked, but unfortunately at times through the destruction of the wicked that God's glory is revealed. Of course, we should stress here, when we speak of God's glory being revealed, uh, some might think we're speaking of some kind of um, an ego trip, gratification. I hope it's clear to us all that besides that being wrong, it's absurd. If I program my computer to sing my praises, I'm not going to feel good about it because I created the program. Well, God created the world. There's nothing that the world can give God that gives anything that God doesn't have. God doesn't need our praises. We do. We need praising God. When we recognize that God represents absolute truth, absolute goodness, absolute righteousness, absolute justice, the glorification of God is the glorification of all of these. The world needs that more than anything else. And so, returning to Exodus chapter 14, when we consider altogether what was the agenda in the splitting of the sea and the destruction of Egypt, as God expresses it to Moses in Exodus chapter 14, verse 4, I will. And he will pursue after them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through all his host. And Egypt will know that I am God. Again, the glorification of God is the glorification of everything that we need to glorify in the world. And the crucial message here, God is concerned for the welfare of Egypt. Egypt needs to know about God. And so indeed we read when in verse 17, God tells Moses what's going to happen, the fulfillment of exactly what was designated in what we just read. Verse 17, I behold will strengthen the heart of Egypt and they will come in after them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through all his host, through his chariots and through his horsemen. And Egypt will know that I am God when I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through his chariots and through his horsemen. Precisely the means through which the glory of God was concealed provide the basis for God's glory being revealed for all to see. Just to consider this message in a few additional passages, briefly. In Psalm 76, likewise, in verse 2 we read, In Judah God is known. His name is great in Israel. How so? Because in verse 4 we read, There he broke the fiery shafts of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle, Selah. It is when evil is vanquished, when wickedness ceases, that we get the good word. God's glory is restored. Just to consider that played out in two additional scenes. Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of Isaiah tells us in verses 15 and 16, behold, God will come in fire and his chariots will be like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire God will enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and the slain of God will be many. God judges. And the consequence of that, as we read in verse 18, the time comes that I will gather all nations and tongues and they will come and will see my glory. And I will place a sign among them and I will send refugees of them unto the nations to Tarshish 
Pul and Lud that draw the bow to Tubal and Yavan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. So all will see. And final example, final example in two passages in the prophets that describe the same event, the final battle, the final battle against God and his people fought right here in Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 38, in verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says God the Lord, that my fury shall rise up in my nostrils. Verse 21, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, says God the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will enter into judgment with him, with pestilence and with blood, and I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him, an overflowing shower with great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Verse 23, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am God. Same event in the last chapter of Zechariah. Beginning in verse 1, behold, the day of God comes when your spoil will be divided in the midst of you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. And there is a vivid, devastating description of the city being taken. In verse 3, then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And the consequence of that, ultimately. Verse 9, and God will be king over all the earth. In that day shall God be one and his name one. Again, the restoration that God's glory fills the earth when those who, through their actions, have done their utmost to conceal their glory serve by force as the means through which God's glory is revealed. God says, I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through his host. They're the ones who have sought to obscure God's glory, as the wicked always do. Ultimately, the mission of the wicked is to produce a world in which we can't see God's glory. They will be the means through which God's glory is revealed. Of course, we pray through the repentance of the wicked, but one way or another, wickedness must cease. And that, in some sense, is likewise a theme of the commemoration and celebration of the second holiday. The double holiday of Passover, leaving the land of Egypt, leaving Egypt, seeing that everything that Egypt represented, this world the greatness, this world the might, this worldly wickedness ultimately lies there dead, finished, bankrupt for all to see. And so may we all succeed in our various individual and collective battles with the Egypts in which we are immersed nowadays. First, to get out of the land of Egypt, because that necessarily is the first step. We only get to leaving Egypt after we've extricated ourselves from the land of Egypt in which we almost inevitably find ourselves in one way or another in this world. But that's not all. Again, we need to flush Egypt out of ourselves. We need to leave not only the land of Egypt, we need to leave Egypt. We need to get ourselves to the point the state of mind, the realization that whatever was our Egypt really is dead, finished, bankrupt, over. Once we do that, we're ready to declare we revere God 
we believe in God alone. That great blessing that comes not only from the first day of Passover, but from the seventh as well. The second holiday, the double holiday of Passover. Two holidays for two liberations. Feeling on both these levels, God's gifts, God's blessings. God bless you.